National Lipid Association just posted these recommendations um, the week of September 15th, and it was published in the National um, or in the clinical in the Journal of Clinical Lipidology. So um, these guidelines are brand new, and it'll talk about how healthcare providers should be looking at and treating cholesterol. So I always first want to start out now with what what does your healthcare provide provider currently look at when treating your cholesterol. So I have this screen up here just to be a little bit reminder that the total cholesterol equals your good cholesterol, which is your HDL cholesterol, plus your bad cholesterol, the LDL cholesterol, plus triglycerides divided by 5. Um, of course, if your triglycerides are over 400, this equation is not accurate at all. But I just want you to kind of know the, how the cholesterol equation is. And um, Currently, what health healthcare providers do is they look at your LDL cholesterol first. That's our primary source to treat. We first treat the LDL cholesterol before we look at the HDL and triglycerides. Um, and that's the way it's been for several years now is our primary target is the LDL cholesterol. The new treatment guidelines just came out from the National Lipid Association, and it has brought it with it some new guideline treatment targets. And one of those new targets is what we call non-HDL cholesterol. And so I want to back, back up to that equation. And if you actually look, um, if you take your, the total cholesterol and you subtract out your good, you're only left with the bad particle. Okay, so with non-HDL cholesterol is just your total cholesterol minus the HDL. That's all non-HDL cholesterol is. So the new treatment guideline set by the National Lipid Association is recommending that the primary treat treatment, treatment target be non-HDL cholesterol as well as the LDL. So your healthcare care provider shouldn't just be looking at the LDL um, at the offset. They should actually be looking at the non-HDL and the LDL as primary treatment targets. And we'll go into this in further detail as we go throughout the presentation. What was also interesting is that in the new guidelines, they had given an optional secondary treatment target. And that's something called Apple B. Um, and if you wanted to replace Apple B, you could do LDL particles. Um, I work in the Cardio Wellness Center um, here in town at St. Luke's, and we do some LDL particle testing. It's interesting um, because the Apple B particles and LDL particles can sometimes remain high even though we have your LDL cholesterol and other aspects of your cholesterol at goal. We call that like a residual effect, that there's a residual risk left even after your standard cholesterol has been treated. And that is because in some people, even after you treat your standard cholesterol, um, your standard cholesterol like LDL and HDL and triglycerides components, um, the the advanced tests like Apple B and LDL particles can still be off in some individuals, not all. So that's given us an optional secondary treatment target. Um, and I will say, if anybody's triglycerides are 500 or greater, that is going to be um, that's going to change things, and that will become the primary treatment target because we worry about pancreatitis when people's triglycerides are 500 or higher. Um, so if someone's triglycerides um, come in to the healthcare provider, the first goal will be to treat the triglycerides. But if that's not the case, um, then we will shoot for primary treatment targets of this non-HDL cholesterol, which is just your total cholesterol minus your HDL minus your good cholesterol. So that's on this next slide. It's looking at um, non-HDL cholesterol, um, which is the new one of the new primary targets, um, in more detail. So total cholesterol minus your good, your HDL gives you your non-HDL cholesterol. So if we look at this patient here, this patient's total cholesterol is 220 and the HDL is 39. If we take the total cholesterol minus the HDL, we get the non-HDL cholesterol. So 220 minus 39 equals 181. So this patient's non-HDL cholesterol is 181. And I'm going to use this actual case throughout the whole presentation. And so this is a 50-year-old male whose father died of a heart attack at the age of 48. His brother had open heart surgery at age 50, and the patient has high blood pressure. Okay, so this person, um, this male, 
this year old male has a non HDL of 181. So that's the bad, um, that's what's left here of the bad particles. Okay. Because non HDL is made up of potentially bad particles that promote plaque buildup in arteries. We call them atherogenic particles, and those are just particles that promote plaque buildup in arteries. There are other types of bad particles um, besides LDL cholesterol. We have intermediate density lipoproteins, which are IDLs. There's very low density lipoproteins, which are VLDLs. There's chylomicron remnants. There's LP little a. So there's multiple other types of bad cholesterol that um, are, uh, are in our bodies. And this is looking at potentially all the bad particles. And so that's what we do is we take out the good, good cholesterol and then we can look at what's left and how much bad particles we have by looking at the non-HDL cholesterol. Studies have demonstrated that the non-HDL cholesterol is a stronger predictor of atherosclerotic, so stronger predictor of plaque buildup and cardiovascular um, death and morbidities than LDL cholesterol. So that's one of the reasons why the National Lipid Association has recommended this non-HDL cholesterol be a primary target to guide our treatment. Um, next, the optional secondary target that they talked about was the apple B particles. So each potentially plaque promoting particle that we have in our body contains a single molecule of apple B. So every type of potentially plaque promoting particles that we have in our body has a single mo molecule of apple B. So what apple B concentration is, is a direct indicator of the number of circulating particles that have plaque building potential. And <clears throat> it's, it is not recommended that we check this um, initially, in fact, we should wait till um, we have people at goal or where to the, we could get individuals to on their standard cholesterol components um, where we think we're going to get them to or what's optimal for them. And then it would be smart to check it after that and see, okay, now that we think we're at goal, did we miss anything as the Apple B particles are high? Apple B is strongly associated with cardiovascular disease events. It's more predictive of cardiovascular risk than LDL or bad cholesterol. It can remain elevated, and this is what I was saying early, earlier. These apple B particles can remain elevated in some individuals once you've already attained your standard, the standard components of the cholesterol, once you've already got them at goal. In some individuals, that those remain elevated, and we perhaps need to even be more strict um, with treatment options. So that's what we call residual risk, is once we get standard components to, um, to ranges, um, did we miss anything? Are apple B or lipoprotein particles um, elevated? And so this would be an option to check those secondary targets. And again, it's, this is, measurement is not typically necessary until goal levels of the LDL and triglycerides have been reached. And apple B can be checked in a non-fasting state. You don't have to fast for this. Okay, so what's recommending we target, the new guidelines, is when an individual comes to see us for cholesterol, that we look at their non-HDL cholesterol first and their LDL cholesterol. Once we've got those where we think they're optimal, our secondary options will be to look at apple B or LDL particle. LDL particle are bad particles. It's the amount of particles that make up our LDL. And we can do this in replacement of apple B. And then again, excuse me, if someone's triglycerides are going to be greater than 500, that becomes our primary target because we do worry about pancreatitis and issues with high triglycerides. Okay, so next are what are optimal levels? And I'll leave this slide up here for just a bit, but um, your non-HDL level, you basically want it less than 130, all right? And a good rule of thumb on non-HDL levels, whatever your LDL goal is, your non-HDL goal will be 30 points higher. So if you're targeting an LDL of less than 100, your non-HDL goal is going to be less than 130. If you're targeting an LDL um, between 100 and 129, 
your non-HDL goal is going to be 130 to 159. So it's about 30 points higher as your non-HDL. Um, so it would be best to get people at desirable ranges for non-HDL and LDL, as well as triglycerides, OK? HDL, we do not have a target as to how high we should go with HDL cholesterol. In fact, we don't know. We know low HDL is a risk for heart disease. But raising HDL, we haven't found a way to raise HDL that substantially lowers risks that we know of. Um, the best way to going to be raising HDL is going to be if you're smoking, stop smoking. If you don't exercise, start exercising um, and to achieve an ideal weight. Those are the three best ways that you're going to have to naturally raise HDL cholesterol. Um, but it is a risk if you're a male with an HDL under 40 and a female with an um, HDL under 50. Um, that's really all the guidelines say about HDL. They mainly concentrate on treating non-HDL, LDL, triglycerides. Once we've got the standard components, then we're going to look at secondary targets like Apple B and LDL particles. So the next question is, where should my levels be? Um, and we base where we want, want your levels as healthcare providers based upon risk. And the National Lipid Association new guidelines came out, and they have low, moderate, high, and very high um, risks. So low, moderate, high, and very high risks. High and very high risk, that's looking at patients with um, heart disease, some type of cardiovascular disease. Um, I'm going to turn the slide here. I'll, I'll show you this again. So your high, very, high or very high risk is going to be people with diabetes, type 1 or type 2, chronic kidney disease. Um, that should be LDL, not LCL, to change that later. LDL, cholesterol that's greater than or equal to 190 milligrams per deciliter. And patients with known cardiovascular disease. So what equates, what's equivalent to cardiovascular disease? What are we calling cardiovascular disease? So if someone's had a heart attack or an angioplasty or, or you know, where they ballooned, opened the artery, or they put a stent in the artery or they did open heart surgery, any type of revasculature um, type of procedure where they had to open an artery. Those that have had a prior TIA, which is a kind of like a mini stroke, precursor usually to a bigger stroke. Those that have had an ischemic stroke, people with peripheral artery disease, and people with have carotid disease. So carotid disease is disease of our neck arteries that's greater than 50%. So that's included as cardiovascular disease. So people that have cardiovascular disease, diabetes, kidney disease, and an LDL greater than 190 is going to be in the high to very high risk category. Um, what you want to do is you, when we look at what determines high and very high, if you have heart disease and diabetes, that's going to be a very high risk. If you've got diabetes with one or two other risk factors, that's going to be a very high risk. Um, if you have an LDL of 190 and heart disease, that's going to be a very high risk. So when we're combining these, um, the high risk goes to very high. Um, now, Let's look in this more detail. You have low, moderate, high, and very high. And I just kind of went over um, this very, very high and high. Okay, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, LDL greater that are equal to 190. And this is atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, so that's heart disease, the diseases we just went over, and those with diabetes. Okay. Then the rest of it of them, when you look at low, moderate, and high, is looking at risk factors. Either you have zero to one risk factors for heart disease, and that gives you a low risk. 